I invite you to turn in your Bibles to the book of Daniel and Daniel chapter 7, this utterly important chapter in our Bibles. It was in the 1890s that H.G. Wells wrote a series of fictional essays. They were describing a Martian invasion of London. And Martians would come down in metal tripods and hot laser beams and noxious, poisonous black clouds of gas and decimate the Earth's population. H.G. Wells apparently wrote these essays as a tirade against Western imperialism with all of their technology taking advantage of aboriginal peoples on the other side of the planet. What would it be like if a stronger power with better technology came and invaded us? That was the point of his story. I read The War of the Worlds as a fiction novel, those essays compiled together into one narrative as an elementary school kid. I remember where I was in my bunk bed. I remember the blankets that covered me and I remembered how terrified I was of this story. And reading it at night and then trying to sleep was not a wise choice. And I knew it was fiction. I knew that the time stamp of the 1890s had come and gone and no such tripods had arrived. We had discovered that um, that probably wasn't going to happen. Some, however, it were introduced to H.G. Wells' story by a radio broadcast by a man named Orson Welles, who in 1938 read the uh, detailed narrative as news. So there was a radio broadcast, and we interrupt this programming to bring you, and then he read the story. And it came bookended without any apology, without any explanation, but just for the sheer shock value of interrupting your daily life with the real news of Martians invading London and terrorizing the populace. Some heard it as news, and, and perhaps the report is exaggerated, but at least a handful of people ran out into the streets terrified. One report said millions of people left their homes in terror. That's probably overstated. But could you imagine hearing that interruption of your daily life and the normal radio broadcast with this shocking news? I knew it was fiction, but the poor people who listened to the radio broadcast saw this as a life-altering interruption. I think I'll go upstate this week and go to the lake. Uh, those plans change how you think about your daily routine, everything came to a halt. There is an interruption in the programming of Daniel 7 in the text that we'll look at tonight. We have been looking at the world powers in beastly succession in this Daniel chapter 7 vision up to this point, the Babylonians and the Medo-Persians and the Greeks and the Romans in phase one and phase two. And that all comes to a screeching halt in Daniel 7 verse 9 with this interruption. But unlike the interruption of the broadcast of War of the Worlds, the emotions here are flipped. We go from terrifying reality of the succession of human empires interrupted by otherworldly comfort. We interrupt this broadcast to bring you comfort from heaven. And we need this section, this interruption, this heavenly interlude in Daniel chapter 7. The world has been going to the beasts in a handbasket, or the beasts have been taking the world to hell in a handbasket. And I don't know what a handbasket is or why the world is traveling in it. But this breaking news, this interruption of the program, this interruption of your life tonight, the interruption of this critical conflict is designed by God in this text to settle your heart, to settle your heart under unsettling circumstances, the unsettling circumstances of the progression of beastly human governments. This is a timeless message for God's people. 
we need this. There have been various forms of bad governments in human history. There have been seasons of relative peace for God's faithful. The apex or the golden age of Israel's history was a time of peace for the faithful. Geneva in Calvin's day or Scotland during two successive revivals that it could be said in Edinburgh that there was a church on every corner and they were all good ones preaching the truth and sending missionaries to the ends of the earth. Our own nation has experienced a really remarkable period of freedom and prosperity that has allowed gospel gatherings to take place unhindered. That has not been, that has not been the experience of most of God's people under most of human history. We have in Daniel chapter 7 something of a spoiler in this interlude. It tells us the end of the story of the age of man. And some want to know the end result of a football game before they watch the game. Others don't want to know. But life is not a sporting event set up for entertainment. It's not a fiction novel whose ending, uh, if told, would ruin the reading of it. No, for the people of God to know the end from the beginning isn't spoiling the story. It's actually critically important for living life correctly. God has seen fit to tell us the end from the beginning on purpose because he knows we need it. Those who would dismiss eschatology as something unimportant, as some frivolous waste of mental energy, have missed God's heart on this. We're going to look tonight at two comforts for God's people unsettled by beastly human governments or just the beastly nature of human history. We begin by looking at a contrast from from verse 8. Notice back what we looked at last week. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. Three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. This little horn, this arrogant, insolent, blasphemous horn presents spew coming from the fourth beast and the head of the fourth beast, the last human government. This is the culmination of a cacophonous orchestra of human rebellion. And if you imagine an orchestra with Satan the conductor and every unredeemed member of humanity, a player coming to a hideous crescendo at the end of history, and then verse 9, the heavenly court. God here is unflinching, seated on his throne, the sovereign one patiently administering resolute justice. The scene dramatically and abruptly goes from chaos to order, from blasphemy to righteousness. And we discover here that the universe is in good hands. Read with me Daniel chapter 7, verses 9 to 12. I kept looking until thrones were set up. And the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames. Its wheels were a burning fire. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. And thousands upon thousands were attending him. And myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat. The books were opened. Then I kept looking because of the sound of the boastful words which the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body was destroyed and given to the burning fire. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time. We come here beginning in verse 9 to the court of heaven. And this really is the first comfort for us as we survey the scene of all of human governments to come. The court of heaven has always been present, an abiding reality. God seated on his throne, sovereign over all things. And now Daniel's attention is turned to this scene. He says, I kept looking. And that phrase comes again and again in Daniel's visions. He is captivated. He is gripped. 
what is happening next. I can't take my eyes off of these scenes. Kind of the way we view a freeway collision. There is something compelling. We must look at it. Daniel kept looking. Until thrones were set up, he says. That is, thrones were placed. Older English versions tell us that thrones were cast down. The Aramaic word here simply means to positively set them in place. This is not about the demolition of the thrones beforehand of the four empires. This is the setting up of the courtroom for judgment of those empires. Thrones were placed. Court is about to be in session. There are plural thrones here, and we'll find out that there is only one seated on a throne, at least stated so in this text. What are these other thrones? Uh, Whom are they for? A number of possibilities have been thrown out there. Perhaps these are thrones for the angelic realm. Psalm Psalm 89 tells us that there is a council of the holy ones in the throne room of God. Are these angels also in this judgment council? Perhaps other heavenly beings are in view here. Isaiah 6, seraphim, the fiery ones. Or Revelation 4, 4, the 24 elders are given thrones. What about saints? Saints are said to judge the world, to judge angels, and to judge the nations. Are God's faithful ones here enthroned? Or perhaps a reference to Trinitarian persons. In Revelation 1.4, the sevenfold spirit is before the throne in the throne room. Or perhaps this is the other thrones are, are there, one for the Son of Man. John 5.26 tells us that the Father gives all judgment to the Son. Because he is the son of man, we're going to look at him in further detail next week. We're not told explicitly what these plural thrones are for. What we are told in this text is the ancient of days took his seat. This title for God here, ancient of days, only shows up in the book of Daniel. It only shows up in Daniel 7, three times, verse 9, verse 12, and verse 22. And to call God the ancient of days here is to make a reference to his oldness. But when you think oldness, don't think infirm, frail, and senile. Think about wise, venerable, majestic, respected, knowledgeable. And the language allows here, although it doesn't demand, his eternality. He is, in fact, the eternal one, the one who has always been. He is from of old. He has seen everything. He outlasts every empire. He was before all things, and he will be forevermore. And this is the one who sits, and he is to judge. He's able to judge. He is the ancient of days. And Daniel says he sat. This is a courtroom scene, and God is the judge, This is not a battlefield scene. There's no picture of of some uh, unknown outcome as if human history comes to its end in some epic fight scene, some back and forth tug of war between yin and yang or, or light and dark sides of a force. You were either on the right side or the wrong side of this eternal, omniscient, omnipotent judge of all. The Ancient of Days sits because he has no need of conscripting an army to try to defeat the powers of darkness. He only need pronounce judgment and the eternal sentence will be executed. Daniel says his vesture was like white snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. White snow and pure wool here are evoking the idea of purity and innocence God himself is pure and innocent and clean. Listen to the way these images are used in Isaiah chapter 1. God says to his people, wash yourselves, make yourselves clean, remove the evil of your deeds from my sight, cease to do evil, learn to do good, seek justice, reprove the ruthless, defend the orphan, plead for the widow. And then he says, come now, let us reason together, says Yahweh, though your sins are as scarlet, They will be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they will be as wool. What is the picture of snow and wool in contrast to the scarlet and crimson in that text? Purity, innocence, free from all taint of all sin. 
In Revelation 1.14, we get a depiction of the Lord Jesus Christ in glory in the vision of John, the revelator. John records there, his head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. And we shouldn't be surprised that the description of God the Father here in Daniel chapter 7 is very similar to the depiction of God the Son in Revelation 1.14, and we'll see the connection to that next week. This white, pure innocence is a purity of justice, a purity of judgment. It is justice untainted. It is clean righteousness. Listen, the empires of man come and go, each of them tainted, each of them sinful. Kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall, and kings with blood-stained hands replace one another in a long succession of bad to worse, back to a little less worse, to bad again, and finally to the worst of all. But this one, before whom all other kings will fall, is innocent, perfect, righteous. Daniel tells us his throne was ablaze with flames. Thrones in ancient days were supposed to be impressive. They were to be daunting and glorious. They were intimidating. They were made to feel everyone that's not on the throne to feel small. Ancient thrones typically were made of wood and overlaid with valuable materials. A throne overlaid with gold would be impressive, brilliant, and glorious. This throne is, as one commentator has said, recognizable as a throne, but it is constructed entirely of fire. And this would put all of the thrones to shame. The intimidation factor, the glory factor, the scary factor of all other thrones pale in comparison to this throne. This is a throne of majesty, of terror. It is a purifying throne in the way that fire purifies all that is before it. Daniel tells us its wheels were a burning fire. And ancient thrones were often built with wheels in order to be moved where needed. It gave the idea that the king could be anywhere in his realm and exercise his sovereign authority. And here the wheels demonstrate that very same thing, that this judge, this king of all kings, is in fact omnipresent. And these are wheels not just of fire, but of burning fire. That is a constant active fire. They are fiery throne with fiery wheels of blazing fire. Mobile, not static. They're not in a fixed location depicting God's omnipresence. This is reminiscent of the scene of the throne in Ezekiel chapter 1. The wheels there move about wherever God wants. And notice verse 10, a river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Not coming out from the throne, but coming out from him. Fire, of course, is often associated with God's presence and with God's presence in particular in judgment contexts. But listen to just a few texts. Genesis 15, 17 God appeared as a smoking oven and flaming torch. In Exodus 3, 2, the pre-incarnate Son of God, the angel of Yahweh appeared in a blazing fire from the midst of a bush. In Exodus 13, 21, God appeared as a pillar of fire. In Deuteronomy 4, 24, Yahweh God is a consuming fire, a jealous God. Psalm 50, verse 3, fire devours before him, and it is very tempestuous around him. Psalm 97, 2 and 3, clouds and thick darkness surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Fire goes out before him and burns up his adversaries round about. Isaiah 30, verse 27, his lips are filled with indignation and his tongue is like a consuming fire. Zephaniah 1, 18, Neither their silver nor their gold will be able to deliver them on the day of the Lord's wrath. All the earth will be devoured in the fire of his jealousy. He will make a complete end, indeed a terrifying one, of all the inhabitants of the earth. 
Hebrews 12, 29 echoes, our God is a consuming fire. These fire themes in Scripture, Old Testament and New Testament, describe our God. A fire which itself is a purity that then is purifying, burning away all that cannot survive its infernal blast. It is the outpouring of God's wrath against sin and all uncleanness. It is the radiation of God's goodness, His beauty, His excellence in the presence of that which is not good and beautiful and excellent. Verse 10 tells us thousands upon thousands were attending Him. Literally, a thousand thousands. How much is a thousand thousands? A million. Put some zeros in there. And they are attending. Literally, they are ministering. This is worship. They are attending God and rendering to Him the glory that He is due. And you can see something like this in Revelation chapter 5 with the concentric circles of worshipers surrounding the throne. Four living creatures, 24 elders on their thrones. And then thousands and thousands of angels worshiping Him. Notice the next phrase, myriads upon myriads were standing before Him. Literally, a myriad myriads. A myriad is a 10,000. So, a 10,000 of 10,000, that's a 100 million. And they're standing before Him. The idea of standing here is a standing in readiness as His servants. Eager, willing, ready to do His bidding. And if we take these numbers here straight forward, that you have a thousand thousands plus ten thousand ten thousands, you end up with 101 million beings of some sort. But I don't know that that truly is the number. I think Daniel here is taking a first look and sees a million, takes a second look and notices a hundred million, and if he were to take a third look, what would he see next? This is an increasing number. Likely, it's an uncountable number of beings worshiping the Ancient of Days, ready to do all that He may bid. What are these beings? Are they angels? Are they angels plus the four living creatures? Are they the 24 elders? Are they saints? Again, we're not told explicitly. We are told this in Revelation 5.11, I looked, I heard the voice of many angels around the throne and the living creatures and the elders. The idea is the angels are around the throne with the four living creatures and the 24 elders. And those angels were myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands. And if the of there in the Greek text in Revelation 5.11 indicates multiplication, then you come up with a number of, at bare minimum, 404 million angels, right? If we take thousands as plural and just mean 2,000 times 2,000, myriads as plural, meaning not one myriad, but two myriads times two myriads, you end up with 404 million angels, I think we're to believe there are many, many more than that. This is a remarkable scene. And, and remember the theological context of the book of Daniel. Daniel is writing amidst the pantheon, that is, these various nations had multiple deities. In fact, in Babylon itself were multiple temples to various deities. And they don't mind being competitors with one another. They're okay to sit next to each other. Those deities don't see themselves as peerless with no rivals. In fact, those little pantheons are at regional conflict with other nations and their pantheons of gods. So I have my shelf with my series of gods, and I kind of pick my favorite, and I give my sacrifices to my favorite god, and I hope that my gods are stronger than your gods, and we'll get our human armies to fight your human armies, and if my country beats your country, that means my god's stronger than your god. And then you come to this scene of heaven, and the truth, and the one true God, is not on a shelf with a bunch of other deities. And he is not a regional God, as if the God of Israel is good for Israel, but the God of Babylon is good for Babylon, and the gods of Assyria are good for Assyria, and they're just going to duke it out and see who wins. 
Now, this is Yahweh of hosts, Yahweh of armies. And while Marduk was just Marduk, he's just one little fake God, Yahweh has armies of supernatural beings at his behest that are all loyal to him, all created by him, all dependent upon him, and they do not shirk their duties and they cannot fail in his purpose. The theological war, the supposed theological war, oh, the gods of Babylon must be stronger than the God of Israel because we won and we took them captive. We even took the stuff out of their temple and put it on our little museum. Well, the curtain gets pulled back on that sorry story. The one true God with all the power, no rivals, not fighting cosmic battles with other regional deities using the chess pieces of national armies. He is surrounded by an innumerable host of supernatural beings. And heaven is a unified loyalty to the righteous one. There is not in heaven some internal governmental instability. There are no rivals to power, no assassination attempts, no coups. This army, this uncountable host of supernatural beings is a loyal, unified, heavenly host ready to execute whatever God has decreed. Now think about this in contrast to all the kingdoms that come before God's kingdom on earth. Nebuchadnezzar had his rivals. And you remember Nebuchadnezzar's successors. Back to back to back to back. Assassination, coup, assassination, coup. You remember Belshazzar's last night. Another empire had risen on the horizon, surrounded the city, defeated his armies, and then sneaked in after shoring up the Euphrates River, went right to the palace and offed the king. You remember Darius's power-hungry satraps, willing to lie and scheme for power, putting the king's best servant in a den of lions. Nothing like that in heaven. God's throne is not surrounded by the hangers-on, by the, the clingers, the, the ones who want power, the ones who are trying to get up the ladder, the, the sycophants who just want a piece of the pie, and if the king could be dead and they could take his place, they would. Heaven knows no such thing. These armies are loyal and cannot be otherwise. God's throne has not is not and never will be in jeopardy from some upstart rival. All of heaven's hosts are aligned in righteousness with God's righteous purpose. People of God, you are not alone. You may feel alone at times. To be faithful to God may, may mean to be thrown alone into a pit of lions. To be isolated in persecution, abandoned by friends, forsaken by family. But loyalty to God is a loyalty shared by an innumerable and unconquerable army of perfect holy beings. Hebrews 1 tells us that these beings at God's behest are the servants of those who will inherit salvation. That means this army serves God's people in the present. The court sat, Daniel reports. It's a very short sentence. It means time is up. Court is in session. The deeds are done. And now the exhaustive, flawless investigation is complete. Of course, by investigation, we don't mean that God had to go and find things out. The perfect scrutiny of the eternal, omniscient, omnipresent God who sees the hearts of all men and holds them all to account is ready to judge. Judgment is about to begin. And notice the end of verse 10. And the books were opened. What are these books? There are a number of books that record things in Scripture that show up in the throne room of God. 
This is a way to speak of God's accurate record of all things. And they're not written down in books as if God couldn't remember them. What is the point of this imagery? These books are on display in this vision to let us know that nothing was ever really secret. Every careless word, every selfish motive, every deed, every thought, there was never cover of darkness. Everything done in secret has been done in the fullness of the audience of heaven, unforgotten, recorded, where these books are opened. There are a number of books alluded to in Scripture. There are books like these books in this text of sinful deeds. Isaiah 65, Jeremiah 17, and Revelation 20 all record the evil deeds of sinners done, sins done while on the earth by human beings. Malachi 3.16 speaks of the book of remembrance of good deeds. God is not unaware of the things God's people do that please Him. Those make record books. Psalm 56 describes the sufferings of God's people recorded in God's book. God doesn't forget the sufferings of his people. And then there is, of course, the book of life. Exodus 32, Luke 10, Philippians 4, Psalm 69, Daniel 12, Revelation 3, and Revelation 20. All describe the book of life. That is the book which holds the names of all those purchased by the blood of Christ. It is the record of all those who belong to Him from His eternal plans into eternity future. What's in view here in these books? Particularly the records of the activities of the little horn and his final empire. What's in these books is inarguable. The fact that they're there and they're opened means this is final. There is no appeal. There are no technicalities. There's no Miranda rights. There's no way around recounting a perfect record of all crimes committed. And here are the crimes of the little horn are on display. This leads truly to the second comfort in this vision, the end of the beast the end of the beast. This is a comfort for God's people. The rest of Daniel chapter 7 is going to unfold for us this fourth beast, the second iteration, the revived Roman Empire and the activities of the little horn, the lawless one, the Antichrist who is to come. His persecution of God's people, the blasphemies and the railings against God most high. But we get to know the end from the beginning. Daniel writes, I kept looking. There's that phrase again. What is next? Daniel's on the edge of his seat. What is he paying attention to here in verse 11? I kept looking because of the sound of the great words, the doubly great words, the boastful words, the New American Standard translates it, which the horn was speaking. Daniel's heard a lot of things. He's seen some arrogance in his day, but these boastful words have him on the edge of his seat. He is fascinated. He's, he's glued. He, he can't look away. <clears throat> and we find out in verse 25 of this chapter that this one will speak out against the most high, wear down the saints of the highest one. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time and times and half a time. We'll unfold these blasphemies and these activities in weeks to come. Who is this horn again? This is the little horn from verse 8. He was the little horn that came up from the, the, uh, the set of ten horns, and he pulled up three by violent removal and apparently gets the other seven to submit to his rule, and he secures for himself headship over the final iteration of the fourth beast which then becomes universal and governs the whole earth. 
This is the leader of the revived Roman Empire. And in his person, he embodies that empire, even as Nebuchadnezzar embodied the Babylonian empire as its golden head. This empire to come is the last empire. It is the last government. It is the end of the times of the Gentiles. It is the final chapter of this age. This brings about God's judgment of mankind's achievements and progress. And like the self-aggrandizing attempt at the Tower of Babel, in the plains of Shinar, Daniel here, very close to that same scene, is getting a vision of the end of the last attempt of a unified mankind's audacious coming together against God. And notice what's happening here. Up to the very last minute, this little horn is speaking spewing antagonism towards God. Notice the court has sat. Judgment is here, and yet the little horn makes great speech. This is suicidal provocation. We've heard some shocking things. Nebuchadnezzar, after being exposed to truth, stands on his rooftop and says, is this not Babylon the great, which I have made for the greatness of my name? And you're like, oh, don't say that. Belshazzar, toasting the gods of Babylon in the very utensils of God's holy temple. You have the claims of Herod. You have the claims of all the petty tyrants on the earth who have thought that they ruled by their own power, that they had acquired power by their own ingenuity, and then were going to take all glory for it. These audacious, up-to-the-last-minute boasts are so scary to watch. I was invited to share the gospel with a man on his deathbed, and he was literally smoking a cigarette through the trach hole, taking his last drags. He died three hours later. His response to the gospel... I'll use a colloquialism, was the double bird. Get out of the room. I don't want to hear it from you. Angry against God. Angry against good news. Going to meet his maker. These suicidal provocations are the anthems of mankind. I read to you earlier in this series... William Ernest Henley's poem, Invictus. I'll read it again. He says, Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade. And yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how narrow the path. How charged with punishments the scroll. No matter what the Bible says about coming hell and fire, I don't care. I am the master of my fate, he says. I am the captain of my soul. It's terrifying to think of William Ernest Henley meeting Christ after saying those words. The anthems of rebel humanity are manifold. I think of Tom Petty, you can stand me up at the gates of hell, but I won't back down. I'll stand my ground. ACDC screaming out highway to hell, racing towards it. Rush has their atheistic Anthem, free will. I don't care what any God may think. I get to determine my destiny. I loved my grandfather. I don't know if he died with Christ or without Christ. In his life, he had no profession, no fruit. And he said, I don't care what you tell me about heaven and hell. I'll just figure it out when I get there. Like I figured out everything else in life. 
As tragic as all of these boasts have been, as arrogant, as blasphemous, as worthy of infinite judgment, this little horn will outdo them all, as we shall see. Daniel writes, I kept looking. (laughs) Again, he is on the edge of his seat. Until the beast was slain, he says. When does this beast get slain? Well, the timing of this scene is the coming of Christ. It is the second coming of Christ. This is just before Messiah's kingdom is established on the earth. And and we know that from the order of events here in Daniel chapter 7. We'll we'll get to those in the next vision. The, the, The beast is judged and then the kingdom comes. And this matches the events of Revelation 19 and 20, where the beast is judged, thrown alive into the lake of fire, and Christ sets up his kingdom. Revelation 19 precedes Revelation 20, which describes the thousand-year reign of Messiah on the earth. This lawless one, the Antichrist, the little horn of the revived Roman Empire is judged prior to the establishment of Messiah's kingdom. It is likely in conjunction with the sheep and goats judgment of Matthew 25, where the nations are gathered and people are sorted out. And perhaps there in Matthew 25, it is nations collectively sorted out for how they treated Israel. At that point, repentant Israel as they believe the gospel in their own purification, the the times of Jacob and the troubling of Israel that the great tribulation is designed to bring about, where Israel herself will say, we crucified our Messiah. And they mourn for him as for an only son, Zechariah says. And that sheep and goats judgment, those who have allied themselves with this little horn against Israel and against God will be judged. And they'll be judged for how they treated God's saints during that time period. During the time of the little horn. But I want you to notice the simplicity of this statement here. The beast was slain. This isn't long. It's not drawn out. It is in fact easy. And final. The beast's body was destroyed. That is the body that makes up that fourth empire. The revived Roman Empire is brought to its end as its head is destroyed. This depicts a complete overthrow, not a fizzling out, but a complete in one moment demolition of the Roman Empire. This demands, by the way, a revived Roman Empire still yet future not the fizzling out of the Roman Empire in its first iteration, the Roman Empire that was around after the Greeks and in the time of Christ. And we'll talk about that first Roman Empire at the end of Daniel 7, and we'll walk through some of the history of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire, to borrow the title of Gibbon's famous work on that subject. No, this is the final iteration of the Roman Empire, and it it doesn't fizzle out or fade away or get cut up into pieces and sacked by the vandals. This is an unmistakable final demolition. By the way, this also cuts against the grain of the liberal critics who want to make Daniel not not a prophet not telling the future. They try to have him writing after the facts and they try to insinuate that the fourth kingdom is the Greeks. They want to call the little horn here Antiochus Epiphanes who blasphemed God and called himself God in the temple. He doesn't fit the bill for this. We will see him in the book of Daniel, but not here. Notice what happens to the little horn and the body, this fourth empire, given to the burning fire. That is, given to the fire of God's judgment. And this fire is burning. That is, a constant, continual, perpetual burning. Verse 12 helps us answer the question we might be asking. Okay, what happened to the other three empires? 
They didn't get a, a, a terminus, an absolute demolition when they were dethroned. Their dominion was taken away, but there's still Greeks around. And this verse explains it. As for the rest of the beasts, their dominion was taken away, but an extension of life was granted to them for an appointed period of time, for a season and a time. Now, what does that mean? They, those kingdoms, the, the three beasts prior the Babylonians, the Medo-Persians, and the Greeks, they continue to exist past their unseating from power. And we see that in our own day. Peoples and cultures and languages remained. They're parceled out and incorporated and amalgamated into the successive empires. You can meet Greeks today. A couple of years ago, I met a man speaking Farsi in my neighborhood. He was walking around looking for help, knocking on doors. And uh, Espanol, no, uh, Parlez-vous français? No. I'm trying to figure out what does he speak, and he wrote some stuff out, and I had to go to the internet and look it up. That is a remnant from the Persian Empire in Chandler. <laughs> I just read an article this week about ancient Chaldean culture still being maintained in southern Iraq. Dress, superstitions, etc. And this is interesting. This scene here from verse 12 matches what we saw in the vision in chapter 2. Remember the whole statue represented empires in successive order from the head down to the toes. But when the stone made without hands comes out of heaven and smashes the statue and pulverizes it and turns all of it to dust, it turns the whole statue into dust. In other words, all the remnants of all four empires are brought to one end at the coming of Messiah, the stone. And here we have the same picture. Those other peoples from the previous empires, they, they still go on existing, though they're not the world empires anymore. They've been succeeded by others, eventually succeeded by Rome. But then when Rome is destroyed in its finality, all human government goes away. All sinful human government. To be replaced by the perfect man, the God-man, Messiah, when he comes. This represents the end of sinful human government, the last king, the last empire of the long line of sinful human rulers on the earth. There will be no more election cycles, no more revolutions. This is the end, and it is the beginning. It is the end of the times of the Gentiles. It is the end of man squandering resources and not living up to his image-bearing responsibilities and capabilities, of man in his sinfulness ruining everything. Seven and a half billion flies rotting the ointment. That's what we are. And it is the replacement of all of that with the glorious kingdom of Messiah. God's shalom on the earth. I want us to think about some helps, some comforts, some encouragements, and maybe some warnings this text, this text brings to us. Think about Romans 13 for a moment. You know the obligations there. We are to submit to every form of government. They're placed by God as his steward. We are obligated by God to submit to sinful human government as if there could be any other kind. And this text helps us. God's on his throne. And every government, every iteration of government, and every agent of government, every elected official, every tyrant, and every bureaucrat are held accountable by God for their activities in human government. There are books and things are written. We can trust the Lord with that. A prominent theme in the book of Daniel is the sovereignty of God. This is another reminder. We might feel like things are out of control, that human activities are chaotic and tumultuous, and God sits on his throne. He's sovereign, he's not worried, he's in control, he'll take care of everything. There's something for us to think about in terms of eschatology and our mission as God's people on the earth. How will the dominion of the earth be transferred from the beasts to the saints? We get to see that next week. How will we get from the times of the Gentiles to the glorious kingdom of Messiah? Well, the stone will crush the statue. 
God will pluck the little horn off of his earth and toss him alive into the lake of fire. Revelation 19. And then Messiah will reign on the earth. His saints will reign with him for a thousand years. And the final wonderful chapter leading to the eternal state will ensue. Humanity will not evolve toward that kingdom, improve toward it. The church will not build it nor bring it. This world and its politics will get much worse before becoming better than they've ever been. How will it come about? Hard stop, Daniel 7. A hard stop in Revelation 19. Man's day is done and the Lord's day arrives. There will be no confusion. Nobody's going to be saying, is the kingdom here yet? That kingdom will be very physical. It will be very geographical and very spiritual. That helps us think through what our task is. You heard this from John last week. Mustard seed proclamation. What is our kingdom work? If we even use that phrase. Population of kingdoms citizens. By gospel preaching. There is also in this text for us a warning. A warning of imminent, final, and eternal judgment. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. What's true, the little horn in Daniel chapter 7 becomes true of everyone whose name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life. Listen to Revelation 20, beginning in verse 11. I saw a great white throne and him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, the great and the small, standing before the throne. Books were opened and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. The sea gave up the dead which were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every one of them, according to their deeds. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. That judgment is coming. And it is coming soon. And it is a judgment of infinite proportions. That is the only way finite beings absorb the infinite fury of God against infinite offenses is to do it forever. There's no appeal there. There's no second chance there. There's no annihilation or going out of existence there. The result of sinful deeds committed here in this life is nothing but eternal conscious torment under the righteous wrath of eternal God. That is a broad path that all of humanity is rushing toward. We're going to see in the book of Daniel that Daniel is called one Greatly beloved of the Lord. And John, the apostle who penned this book of Revelation, was called beloved of the Lord. They were both sinners. Whose deeds were worthy to be written in those other books. But who found themselves to have their deeds expunged. And their names written in another book. The book of life. And you need to know, friends, if your name is not found written in the Lamb's book of life, then your deeds are forever recorded in those other books. They are known. They have been seen. Every careless word, every foul motive, every stray thought, every deed you thought was secret, God's metadata is perfect. And there's no getting away from it. This is inexorable, inevitable. 
You have to know, friend, that the God who judges with eternal fire is the one who redeems believers with the infinite, innocent blood of his own son. John 5, 26 tells us that the father has appointed the son to be judge of all. And it is the son who is the only one who has endured infinite judgment and quenched it. Absorbed it as a substitute for all who would place their faith in him. Friends, we get to see the end from the beginning. You get to know how history ends. And you have something to do with how your history ends. (laughs) Will you surrender to God now? Find yourself in Christ. And find yourself beloved of the Lord. And safe in Him. For eternity. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the end of the story. We see how important eschatology is. That is what you have revealed about the future. Let us not shy away, but dive into all that you have said. Let us cling to these truths. Moreover, O God, let everyone here this evening cling to Christ. The only hope for salvation from your wrath. O God, you are the one who judges and you are the one who saves. It is from you we must be saved. It is only by you that we can be saved. And it is to you we are brought as adopted children rather than enemies deserving of wrath. We praise you for your love. We're made small by it. We'll sing of it forever. To you be the glory forever in Jesus' name. Amen.